These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Very often, the oldest stories that I've been telling on this show are the tales of the most important and famous people, kings and gods for the most part. The great masses of ordinary people tend to be treated as averages taken from the general whole. But of course, these were people with lives no less eventful than those of the kings, even if they left less historical record of their passing through life. Of the cuneiform record that's been recovered by archaeologists, it is estimated that some 97% is made up of contracts, legal documents, and accounting receipts, while the remaining 3% are the royal inscriptions, religious hymns, and literary works that make up the majority of recorded history and the majority of this show. Today, however, we're going to take a break from kings and legends and look at that 97%. Now, contracts by themselves are not super interesting, not today and not back then. However, we've come to a point in our history when we are fortunate enough to have recovered a fairly interesting little archive of some 21 documents kept preserved by a man named Ubaram. And with some copious guessing to fill in the gaps, we have just enough detail about him to weave a little story around his life. I should say right at the start that all we really have for him are these 20-odd contracts, receipts, and legal documents. Many of the particulars of this story will be far less grounded than other parts of this show, but they will come from inferences drawn from what we know of other men in Ubaram's position. We have no way of knowing for sure how well we're representing our hero today, but we can be decently confident that his lifestyle wasn't too exceptional. When we last left our history, King Samsu Ilana of Babylon had just died in the year 1712. He would be succeeded by his son, Abi Esha. We will look more at this king when we return to the broader historical narrative next episode, but he is worth mentioning because his name is on every document that we have from Ubaram's little archive. Ubaram himself probably never met the king, but all documents were dated by the year name system, in which the palace announced that each year would have a particular name, such as the year in which Abiyashu dammed up the Tigris, or the year Abiyashu made glowing statues. This is wonderful for historians because they get a sense of what was going on in the kingdom each year. Then official royal scribes would take all the year names and write them down in long lists so that we know the correct order of them all. Except that in Abiyash's reign, we don't seem to have a surviving comprehensive list of year names. And so the order has to be reconstructed with a bit of uncertainty. I'm going to follow the ordering from my usual source of year names, the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative over at UCLA, but it isn't a sure thing, and some of these could happen in a different order from what I'm listing here. With all that out of the way, the story of Ubaram begins properly in the year 1707 BCE, five years into the reign of Abiyashu, in the village of Supper Shabula a ways north of Babylon, though still squarely within Babylonian territory. We know nothing about our protagonist before this year, but we can make a few assumptions. He's likely a young man, fully an adult, but only just getting established. Over time, we will see his wealth start to grow as he matures. He's also a soldier, and all the way from the first contracts, we will occasionally see that the witnesses listed are men with military rank, whether they're acting informally as mere witnesses or friends, or if their consent was required for him to engage in certain peacetime occupations is debated. Being a young man, 1707 may well have been only his second year in the army. It seems there was a large campaign against the Kassites in 1708, as well as a massive Elamite raid at some uncertain point at the beginning of Abiyashu's reign. And one could well imagine a young man leaving his father's house for the first time and signing up as a career soldier, thinking this would be a good way to start his life. One thing the archive is almost completely silent on is anything to do with the actual military side of his life, showing us only the domestic life of a professional soldier. 
Now that the king's campaign against the Kassites is over, Ubarim is able to return to his village on furlough. The nature of this furlough is unclear, and some speculate that here is where Ubarim first forms a relationship with a man named Ili Ikisham. Perhaps Ili Ikisham goes to report for duty in Ubarim's place. This theory has a major problem immediately apparent to those of you who remember Hammurabi's laws. Law number 26 reads, If a soldier who is ordered to go on an errand of the king does not go but hires a substitute and dispatches him in his stead, that soldier shall be put to death. His hired substitute shall take to himself the soldier's house. Now, there are some who believe that this law, while still certainly on the books, is no longer being followed as the Babylonian Empire begins to experience corruption and graft at all levels. There are some who think that a substitute was allowed to take the place of a full soldier during peacetime activities, like assisting on construction projects or perhaps in garrison duties. The traditional view, however, is that the job of a substitute was purely to replace the soldier in the domestic sphere. This is a matter at the very heart of the Ilkham system, that those rendering service to the king, like soldiers and craftsmen, would receive land in exchange for that service, but paradoxically, that very service would render them unable to actually work that land in most cases, and so they would rent out the land to a class of men called Tahum, often translated as substitute or deputy, such as in the law above. But we will see that this traditional view is a bit hard to square with some of the documents in Ubarm's archive. We'll see much more about Tahum and the Ilkham system in a bit, but for now it's enough that in the year 1707, Ubarim, though a professional soldier, was facing the prospect of spending the winter at home. He already had a man contracted to work his own plot, his Tahum Ili Ikisham, and Ubarim was a bit of a hustler not afraid to get a little ambitious. And so, as planting time approaches, he collects a pair of helpers and makes the first of two contracts that we have in his archive with a local landowner named Ilisu Ibnisu. In his first contract, Ubaram and a man named Apil Ilisu rent a certain field from Ilisu Ibnisu for the price of one-third of the harvest. Ilisu Ibnisu was a fairly powerful local official, but this seems to have been his own private land he was renting out, not his Ilkham land, if he had any. At the same time, Ubarim signed a contract for another six acres, which he would work jointly with a fellow named Nurgle Abbey. This second plot appears to have no explicitly stated rent. Rather, they would be responsible for the heavy labor of deep plowing the land after they were finished with it, suggesting that it may have been either a disused or perhaps overused field, and the compensation to the field owner was putting in the work required to make it usable for the next year, including a deep plowing to churn up the soil extra good. With his partners, the agreement with Apil Ilisu is a pretty simple equal partnership, sharing both costs and profits equally. With Nurgle Abbey, however, we start to get a suspicion that Ubarim is maybe interested in securing his own advantage at the expense of his partners when he can, and Nurgle Abbey is on the hook for two-thirds of the expenses, while Ubarim seems to share equally in the profits. Now, we could construct scenarios in which this is a perfectly innocent and reasonable business arrangement, but it could also be the case that Ubarim is taking advantage of Nurgle Abbey. Also, with the two fields being leased, is Ubarim a super hard worker, handling twice the land area of his partners? Or is he acting more like a middleman in these two arrangements, using what may be his connections with fellow military man Ilisu Ibnisu to hook up these two laborers with work for the season while Ubaram himself contributes maybe a bit less to the fields, or under some understandings of how the Ilkham system works, returned to his military garrison and contributed almost nothing except the deal itself? We're well into speculation now, but given what little character emerges from these records, Ubarim seems to be a quite canny entrepreneur.
As the year turns to 1706, we have three new documents, each quite different from the rather standard contracts of the year before. First up, we have a contract that doesn't really fit with the rest. A house owned by Aristi Shamash is rented to Uttal Ishtar for a period of one year for a certain payment. It isn't clear why this tablet was included in the collection, and it may not have actually been in Ubarm's possession, just a tablet that was coincidentally found nearby, possibly belonging to a neighbor. Of passing interest, however, is that Aristi Shamash is clearly identified as a woman, both owning and entering into a contract on this house in her own right, without a man in the way, another verification of the economic rights of Babylonian women. But what has really made Ubarim famous, at least in the fairly limited world of Assyriologists, is that this is the year in which Ubarim and his Tahum, or substitute, Ili Ikisham, had something of a falling out. The document recording this reads, Because Ubarim, head of a military house, and Ili Ikisham, his Tahum, about the division of their field, house, and service obligations were in disagreement, they, by mutual consent, have set the following division. It then goes on to split up Ubarim's Ilkum fields, where two-thirds go to Ubarim and one-third goes to Ili Ikisham. This document is witnessed by both civil and military officials as a mediated settlement over the possession of the Ilkum land, and there is another tablet signed later on the same day that further negotiates purely internal affairs, making Ubarum liable for certain agricultural expenses, but generally confirming that he will receive two-thirds of any harvest. This second tablet is witnessed only by civil officials, presumably the captain who oversaw the first negotiation, left when everything of interest to the military establishment had been settled. It's very easy to understand how some scholars read this settlement as a splitting of both the benefits of the crop and the work obligations, especially since the house itself is explicitly given as a physical division, with Ubarim in two-thirds of the house and Ili Ikisham living in the last third. The big question hanging over all of this is, if Ili Ikisham stayed on the fields all year round, worked all the fields, and delivered two-thirds of the harvest to Ubarim, or if he did one-third of Ubarim's military service, during which time Ubarim worked his third of the fields. The latter is a very understandable reading of this tablet, but it's very hard to square with the logistical difficulties involved. Leaving aside the fact that it was prohibited on pain of death in the still valid law code, there is the obvious problem that agricultural labor is not equal throughout the year, with most of the effort being required at planting and harvest. If Ubarim is responsible for labor on two-thirds of the field, then what happens when he's not physically present during the planting? Or, conversely, what happens to Ili Ikisham's fields if he's away during these critical weeks? It seems like this fails to solve the core problem of the Ilkum system, the need for the fields to be tended and, at the same time, for a person to be in service to the king. There may well have been solutions to these problems, but in the absence of these solutions, I prefer to read these tablets as dividing the benefits between the two on a two-to-one basis, with the man actually doing service to the king, receiving the greater portion, even though it was the Tahum who did all the work in the field. We actually have reason to believe that the original arrangement was even more favorable to Ubarim, and somehow the Tahum, through his complaints, was able to negotiate a more favorable settlement, which would make sense if most years Ubarim wasn't physically capable of being home and managing the lands. Recall that Hammurabi's code also mandates that Ilkum lands not be left untended, and the threat of walking away from the plot may have been enough leverage for Ili Ikisham to obtain a more favorable settlement. Whatever the Tahum's leverage over Ubarim was, Ili Ikisham appears to have remained dissatisfied with the arrangement, and the next year, at around the same time, he initiated a second round of mediation.
In form, we have almost the exact same pair of documents, even signed by many of the same witnesses. Except that here, the Ilkham fields are divided 50-50 among the two men. There are differences in the details about which particular fields go to which man, but on the whole, Ilya Ikasham has managed to assert himself before a council of civil and military officials and gain equal recognition for his status as Tahum. Amusingly, it seems that their bickering has managed to irritate these important men, who required them both to swear at the end of this document on both Marduk and King Abiyashu that this was the final settlement and would not be renegotiated again. But even the frustration of the panelists shows something fairly advanced about Babylonian society. Ubaram is a redum, a regular soldier of no particular rank, and it seems the suit is being brought by a tahum of even lower status, and yet their fight is given the full weight of the Babylonian justice system. The first settlement is witnessed by a panel of seven, of whom at least some are fairly important men, a captain and a general, and some civic leaders, and the second is before a panel of perhaps nine, each time with a scribe hired for the day to record the judgment. This was not cheap, and it seems unlikely that either party had the wealth at this point to pay more than a fraction of it in fees. So we must conclude that the government of Babylon provided a rigorous court system to anyone with disputes, regardless of their social status or ability to pay, at least to a certain extent. It might not seem like much, but justice for all is not something often available in the ancient world, and may have contributed quite a lot to the economic prosperity and general stability of the old Babylonian period. Ubaram wasn't totally the loser in this second and final round of disputation, however. He was able to force Ili Ikasham to accept a third tablet, in which for one year the Tahum would work a large field at his own expense for Ubaram's benefit, a short-term gain for Ubaram in exchange for the long-term gain of Ili Ikasham's higher revenue share. The year turns without any further dispute between Ubaram and his Tahum, and as we get to 1704, we see that Ubaram has begun to accumulate a bit of wealth, perhaps a result of the windfall from the free field that Ilya Kisham was bearing the burdens of the year prior, or possibly acquired through soldiering or some other venture with no surviving record. He invests his wealth, which seems to have been pretty substantial, in livestock, five cows, two bulls, three calves, as well as three goats, one of which is a kid. But of course, Ubaram isn't going to be taking the cattle and goats with him on campaign, so he commissions a fellow named Anna Shamash Lissi to take care of them. As best we can tell, Anna Shamash Lissi is a herdsman of some repute within the town, and owns a large pasture land on which he grazes a number of animals belonging to a variety of owners, taking a portion of the animal product while not having to put up too much of his own capital. Ubaram is now doing pretty well for himself, with revenue coming from animals, from his Ilkham field, and from his military revenues. Perhaps he was undertaking more business ventures for which the records haven't survived, or maybe he's being kept busy with his military duties. We know that right around 1702, there was a campaign into the mountains that seized a town called Adnatum, and in 1700 or 1699, there seems to have been some sort of conflict with the Sealand dynasty, and Ubaram may well have been in the field for either of those, or he could have been involved in the many peacetime activities of a Babylonian common soldier. Forts and cities always needed garrisons, where the soldiers would keep watch and do all sorts of little tasks related to upkeep to keep the town safe, as well as patrolling the streets in a manner not unlike policemen to keep order within the town. And when the peacetime left a king with more soldiers than he really needed, he was quite happy to assign whole companies to work details on the many, many construction projects that wealth and stability allowed the state to undertake. Canal digging, wall repairs, and temple construction were all in the cards to keep the soldiers busy. My own guess, however, is that he was away from town, 
possibly for two years. Because when he returns in 1698, he has quite a lot of business to take care of. We know nothing about his wife or children, but we assume he had them since that was the most common sort of household. Whether he did or not, he was the head of a landowning household, and prominent enough in his community that he owed tithes to his local temples. Five shekels a year to the temple of the sun god Shamash, and some amount to the moon god Sin. When he returns home, it appears that he's two years behind on his dues to Shamash, and pays a bit over eleven and one-third shekels, then goes over to the Temple of Sin and pays another two-thirds shekels. This seems to have settled his account with Shamash and paid a bit into the current year for both gods. Now, this contribution was, first of all, an act of piety, and also a religious obligation, possibly a legal one as well. But the fact that it was required should not take away from the religious sentiments that Ubarum likely felt when contributing to the temple. But this money also had a civic function as well, going into a pot of money that funded a number of temple programs for the benefit of the community, aside from the obvious supporting of the priests and rituals. Of most relevance to Ubaram himself, the temple would be the organization responsible for sponsoring his ransom should he be taken captive in battle, making his contribution now something of a group insurance scheme. It was also at times used as a source for loans, though we don't hear of Ubaram himself taking advantage of this. The temple isn't the only one he owes money to, however. He received a receipt that a certain amount of his goods had been seized by a repo man named Suma Ilum on behalf of a creditor named Imlik Sin, possibly in relation to an unpaid tax obligation. However, paying all these debts seems to be a sign of increased wealth more than one of hardship. He was gone for two years, but he's come back with a fair bit of silver jingling in his pocket, so much so that even after paying all this, he can still afford to purchase four sheep and contract them to a shepherd named Sin Idnam, which could well be an investment of between 30 and 60 shekels, a substantial sum of money, indicating that Ubaram is now solidly in the middle class of Babylonian society. It's possible that this is the kind of wealth that comes when a soldier on campaign manages to participate in the sack of a city. Or perhaps he was just an entrepreneur engaging in economic activities of which we have no record to multiply his wealth. Or it could well be a bit of both. Whatever the case, Ubaram passes the next two years rather peacefully. In the year 1696, we have a contract in which he pledges to serve 20 days for a soldier named Anatom, while Anatom presumably goes home for a bit. This was witnessed by a mid-level military commander, but includes no details about what Ubaram got out of the arrangement, probably because the military commander was only concerned that someone be filling in for the missing soldier. You see, it was strictly prohibited for a Tahum like Ili Ikisham to fill in for a soldier, but for a soldier to replace another of equal rank for a period, especially during peacetime activities, seems perfectly kosher. We aren't sure what exactly the terms of peacetime service were, how many months of the year a full-time professional soldier would actually have been at work, but it does appear that when not on active duty, they could expect a bit of furlough each year. Ubaram is, in effect, selling 20 days of his furlough to another man, though what he gets in return is unspecified. He does this again six months later, suggesting that perhaps Anatom was going home for the planting, maybe because he didn't have a tahum and needed to assist his family at the most pressing time of the year, while Ubaram was content to let others do the fieldwork for him. We go two more peaceful years before hearing more news from Ubaram's archive. It seems that in 1694, he again has the spare time to engage in a bit of cooperative land leasing, like he did back when he was a new soldier. 
This time, he partners with a fellow named Satran Tayar to lease seven anchors from Sunama Ilam for a period of three years, growing a mix of barley and sesame, of which the landowner would get half and the two partners would split the remainder among themselves. Again, we have to ask the question of whether Ubaram actually did any work on this land, or if he was simply acting as a middleman, perhaps fronting some of the expenses and using his contacts. Or was it the case that there was less military work that year, and since his Tahum was already contracted for his main field, he had time to work another field for someone else for a bit of extra money? But as the harvest time comes around, Ubarim starts to have trouble from a different source. It's partially damaged and machine translated from the French in which it was in turn translated from Akkadian, but it's probably the most interesting to me of Ubarim's documents because it represents the minutes, in a sense, from a dispute between Ubarim and his brother, Ili Shikalam. Ubarim, before squad leader Sin Ibni said, this is he, Ili Shikalam, my brother, who, for the sake of this case, is being kept in the city so that he may cultivate my field, and so that barley from his field and from his house he pays. I have made a request to him, but from my field he is paid no royalties. Squad leader Ibni Sin and the court then called Ili Shikalam forward, and they examined the case of the brother, who said, I have not cultivated my brother's field. There is no more reason to examine this case. Elisha Kalam then said, I cannot cultivate this field at the appropriate date, but I will still stand surety over my obligation and measure out for you the appropriate amount of grain. The court then ordered that Ubaram would pay his brother back for the renting of four pairs of oxen. This is an interesting case, and one that precisely follows the Code of Hammurabi. Provision 42, if a man rents a field but does not plant any grain, they shall charge and convict him of not performing the required work in the field, and he shall give to the owner of the field grain in accordance with his neighbor's yield. Modern commenters often refer to this law in terms of lazy renters, and passing mention is made of Ubaram's brother also being lazy which has until now puzzled me a bit. Why, after all, would you accept a lease for a year if you didn't intend to plant on it? But Ili Shikalim seems to imply in his testimony that some other obligation was more pressing and prevented him from honoring his obligation, suggesting it wasn't just laziness. Reinforcing this is the fact that it appears Ili Shikalim already paid for the rental of some oxen, likely for preliminary plowing, and wanted Ubaram to reimburse him for that. Ubaram seems to have not wanted to reimburse his brother since the oxen rental had essentially been wasted by his error. Another interesting aspect of this case is that he does not contest the charges and appears to accept responsibility immediately. Perhaps the two brothers had already fought it out at home in private, and the trial was merely Ubaram getting a written record of what was owed to him, and perhaps the concession of being reimbursed for the oxen was enough to secure Elisha Kalam's agreement. But perhaps the most significant thing in this contract is the mere fact that not only could Ubaram formally hire his brother, he could also take him to court, settling something many cultures would consider to be a family dispute in a public and professional context. You may recall from the colonial merchant companies of Assyria that those were also structured within the context of a household, yet there were no collective household accounts, just an assortment of individual economic actors who happened to be related to each other. They made loans between brothers, contracts between fathers and sons, and whatever affection they likely showed in private was completely beside the point when economic matters were involved. In Sumerian, the word for love itself was a compound of signs that literally meant to demarcate land, indicating that first and foremost, the household was an economic unit, and very often relations between family members were understood in terms of benefits and obligations.
Ubarum has no qualms about taking his brother to court, because for both of them, the fact that they are related as brothers is less important here than the fact that they had also arranged themselves as employer and employee. In the next year, he apparently employs his brother again, this time leasing him a large sesame field to work, in which Ubarum would pay only one-third of the expenses, but share 50-50 in the proceeds. One assumes that this venture turned out better than the attempt the previous year, since we hear nothing more about it. There is also one very terse and cryptic note which looks a bit like when Ubarum had taken over fellow soldier Anatom's duties for 20 days, except that this one is concluded with a fellow named Ili Shikalim. Perhaps this fellow soldier happened to share a name with Ubarum's brother, or perhaps his brother had joined the army as well, or perhaps Ubarum is doing some civilian labor in contract with his brother for 20 days. The document itself is hard to understand without more context. The next year seems to be fairly peaceful, and we have perhaps the most controversial note in the whole archive. This is another short one, stating that Ubarum and his Tahum Ili Ikisham were, as of the fifth day of the month of Kislimun, it's probably sometime in December by our reckoning, all equal with regard to their mutual obligations. Now this is commonly taken as a little memo made between the two of them. After all, unlike the other tablets in the archive, only three gods are listed as witnesses. And as they tally up their debts between each other, they realize that everything is cleared and they make this little tablet to mark it out. But it seems to me that it forgets the important little detail that the way we write things is completely different from how Ubarum would have done it. Ubarum, after all, was illiterate. He has this cache of 21 tablets that he's holding on to over the years, but he didn't write any of them. And in fact, he couldn't read any of them either. He just knew that he needed to hold on to them in case there was a dispute later on. None of his documents were casually recorded, the way we might quickly jot down a note on a scrap of paper. This little receipt involved, at the very least, Ubarum and Ili Ikisham going into town to meet with a scribe and telling him what to write in exchange for a small fee. If nothing else, the recording scribe was a witness to the fact of their agreement. This suggests one of two possibilities. Perhaps one of them had gotten it into their head that they were owed something in their mutual deal, and following an argument or some sort of review of their obligations throughout the year, they concluded that they were, in fact, even, and got this little receipt to prevent any further discussion of the matter. Alternatively, Ili Ikisham has been Ubarm's Tahum for a good 15 years or so, if the dates assigned to these tablets are, in fact, in the correct order. This may have been Ili Ikisham leaving his job on good terms, with both sides taking a receipt that, at the end of their business relationship, there were no outstanding claims on either end. We can't be sure of this, of course, but if our timeline is right, it could well make sense. In the next year, he rents his field out to a man named Awilia for a period of three years, after which point they were to clean up the field and leave it in good order before returning it to the owner. This is, in many ways, a very standard leasing contract and not a replacement Tahum. It is, in fact, quite possible that this is a different plot of land from Ubarum's Ilkum land, one that Ubarum has only recently purchased and may be the same one that was worked by his brother a few years ago. Perhaps Ili Ikisham is in fact still working as Tahum. Also possible is that after 16 years, Ubarum now has a son, invisible in the record, of an age where he can take over the family plot for a time. It would be a bit odd, at least under some interpretations of the Ilkum system, for Ubarum to be able to lease out his Ilkum land. That is, after all, the whole reason the institution of Tahum substitutes were implemented in the first place, since theoretically the king could terminate Ubarum's services at any time and kick him off Ilkum land, making a three-year contract with a tenant look a bit presumptuous.
Which returns us to the idea that Ubarum had purchased this acreage fairly recently, it being listed in the contract as fallow land, possibly never worked before or possibly left fallow for the year or two prior, and is employing Awilia to manage the land for him. Four more quiet years go by, and we reach our last tablet of Ubarum's archive, but our old soldier still has one more trick for us. Ubarum is likely not wealthy, but he is by this point clearly quite comfortable with income from land, livestock, and soldiering that has been accumulated and invested over many years. People in his community now come to him seeking loans, such as Ipku Arhatsam, but Ubarum has been a canny businessman his whole life and shows no signs of stopping now. By law, in Hammurabi's code, a loan of barley could only have an interest rate of 33%, and a loan of silver could have no more than 20% interest. But Ubarum wanted to make his money work much harder than that. And so the contract he signs with Ipku Arhatam states, Two and a third shekels of silver from Ubarum, Ipku Arhatam has borrowed. At the time of the harvest, according to the current price of barley, in payment of the amount on this tablet will Ipku Arhatam measure out barley. The contract was signed near planting season, when barley was relatively expensive, as men who had run out of seed grain like Ipku Arhatam scrambled to purchase enough to have a planting for the year. However, when harvest came around, barley would be at its lowest price of the year, meaning that two and a third shekels was worth far more barley when it came time to pay. Thus, while the contract itself appears to have a 0% interest rate, thus safeguarding it from Hammurabi's usury laws, one assumes that in a normal year the seasonal price fluctuation may have been far in excess of legal interest limits, circumventing the consumer protections and netting Ubarum a tidy little profit. And here, sadly, the tale of Ubarum comes to an end. The record simply stops in 1687, 20 years after it had begun. We can only speculate as to what became of our entrepreneurial soldier after this. He could simply have died. There were plenty of perils to go around among regular people, and being a soldier was naturally even more hazardous. What I like to think, however, and based on absolutely no evidence, is that after 20 years in uniform, Ubarum chose this moment to retire. Since he's no longer providing a service to the king, he forfeits his Ilkham land and house, and has to move somewhere else, presumably leaving all of these unneeded records behind while taking ones he might deem more important, like his military and family records, with him to his new house. Of course, Ubarum is fine losing this land, since he's been able to save and invest enough to see him through the transition into civilian life. And seeing what a hustler he was while spending most of his time in the army, there's every reason to think that this retirement from army life was not an abandonment of work altogether. He is perhaps 40 years old now, give or take a bit, and a well-known member of his community with a good deal of income. Surely he can find plenty of more profit opportunities to finish out the rest of his life. I hope you've enjoyed the tale of Ubarum as much as I've enjoyed interpreting the puzzle of his life. There's only so much that we can do with only economic records, and his family life and military service remain obscure even here at the end. Most of all, the evidence of his life that he left behind can tell us nothing about things like how happy he was in general, or what he thought about politics, gods, and the daily struggles of life. But as we move forward in time, to eras with increasingly more surviving documentation, I will be on the lookout for more caches of documents that can tell us a story about the little people who lived and died so long ago. Next week, we return to the realm of kings as we begin to wrap up the late Old Babylonian period. There is still plenty of military action, general prosperity, and even scientific advancement to look at. So join us next time as we pick back up in history with the prosperous reigns of the final kings of Hammurabi's dynasty. Thank you for listening.